going to do a little work on a National Electric today. This would be a Studio 66 that was made, I'm told, in 1965. 66 being the model number and a route upon which you can get your kicks. Now I actually don't know a whole lot about the history of National Electric guitars from this period. I don't see a whole lot of them. Um, there's also not a whole lot of info about these online, such that you get a lot of speculation and non-confirmed statements about how many models there were when they came out, etc. I do know for a fact that these were built by Valco in Chicago. Valco was known primarily for building amplifiers uh, through the 40s and 50s under names like Supro and Airline. It was started by former owners of the National Dobro Company. They made lines of resonators and lap steel guitars as well. And they built amps for other companies like Gretchen Harmony too. In the early 60s, someone there had a bright idea to try building guitar bodies out of molded fiberglass and resin, a technology that had been used for things like Corvette bodies or the mid-century modern chairs of Charles and Ray Eames. You know, it's tough, durable, relatively inexpensive, uh, because unlike wood, when the components come out of the mold, the surface is already smooth and pretty shiny. It doesn't take a whole lot of work to, you know, make it finished looking. That's something that's always surprised me that this was a thing, this kind of cost-cutting measure, given how inexpensive wood was at the time. In retrospect, there's a kind of naive, space-agey element to them that's very alluring. They registered the trademark Rezo glass to describe these, and marketed them under the Airline and Supro brands, as well as uh, this one, the National. There are a bunch of different models, from the basic, like this one here, it's a single pickup, to much more elaborate three pickup guitars with umpteen gazillion knobs and switches on them. They really do take a while to find your way around. And uh, they also came up with some really innovative futuristic body shapes that had names that sounded like country clubs in Connecticut, like the Glenwood, for instance, which is shaped like a map of the US. With the plasticky aesthetic, you might mistake these for low budget entry level guitars, but no, not really. They were up there in price for guitars that sold in mail-order catalogs, like Montgomery Ward. See, the bodies are made in two pieces. The molds were filled with the fiberglass matting, soaked in epoxy resin, and allowed to cure. And the excess was trimmed off around the edges, and you end up with um, kind of a guitar-shaped dish in which you can glue in a center wooden block to support the bridge and the pickups and provide stiffness, not unlike a Gibson ES series guitar. Uh, then the rubbery kind of gasket was applied to keep the halves aligned. You don't really want to take one of these old ones apart unless you have to, because it's like an oddly shaped and very annoying rubber-made lid that doesn't want to sit where you want to put it, you know. It takes a bit of effort sometimes. Then you screw it together around the body. It's a pretty novel idea. Players of note... The only one that springs to mind is Jack White. These have never been identified as particularly nice guitars to play, and even Jack, during his White Stripes period when he was using them, he'd come out with statements like, you know, he, he wanted to fight the guitar as part of his playing experience. He wanted it to be difficult for himself, which is an interesting thing to say. So I think the setups might have been a bit on the high side, a bit tough, you know, that kind of thing. Nowadays, the Rezo Glass name has been resurrected in the form of kit guitars, which you can assemble yourself. Seems like a fun adventure. One feature of note on the Valco guitars is the Supro Airline style bridge, which has got this interesting lightning bolt pattern to it. Very sculptural. Occasionally I get to copy this design or my own sort of take on it for Alfie Smith because he likes it on some of his guitars. Um, it's fun to make. I would really love to get a look at the machine that they used to make this in the factory, or, or know the process, because um, carving it by hand is one thing, but it's so sculptural that it must have been a fun process in a factory situation. This thing has got a very characteristic old rubber vinyl smell to it that reminds me of doctor's offices in years gone by. Um, sort of a hospital smell. Impossible to describe, but it conjures up images of hypodermic needles. 
Anyway, anyway, the action is currently six and a half sixty fourths, and no, I won't reduce that fraction. On the base side, five on the treble, a little bit high. And measuring with a capo on the first fret and holding down at the body joint, checking the relief in the neck at around the sixth and seventh fret, we're up around thirteen thousandths. Again, a little high, not too bad though. The thing is, in these guitars, no truss rod. Which is interesting, right, for a guitar that's made in the mid-60s? That's probably the source of the perception that these are a little hard to play. Because, you know, if you had heavy strings on them, they might turn into a banana. What do you do about that? You refret it. Sometimes you can dress excess relief out of the tops of the frets if they're tall enough. In this case, though, the owner wants something a little larger overall. I like to start with string tension on and get a quick picture of what the neck is doing. And I'm looking to see where the curve is concentrated, you know, if there's a hump down where the uh, it joins the body, or if the end is rising up. Those are all important things to take note of. I'll also measure the relief of the fingerboard itself, rather than the fret tops, with the notch straight edge. Um, I'll also do this again with the guitar upright in playing position, because that can vary slightly. Again, we're around 12 thousandths with string tension on. This is an important variable in guitars without a truss rod, because it can affect how I go about the actual fretting. If the board was perfectly straight now, and the relief was all in the frets, it would be a different matter. Now I've temporarily slackened the strings, and I'm measuring again to see what the difference is. Uh, this will give me an idea of just how much the neck moves under tension. Right now I'm showing about six thousandths, versus the twelve to thirteen that we had previously. So I can say that this neck pulls upwards about six thousandths under tension. I plugged it in, it makes sound. I've noticed that uh, the volume pot is pretty shaky in there. That needs tightening. With no truss rod and a bit of a bowed neck, this is a good time for the neck jig. The body rests on these height adjustable pads, and it's held in place with a strap clamp. People get worried about this. It's not super tight, it's just snug enough to keep it in place. I mean, if you really ratchet it down, yes, you could break the guitar, but I'm not going to do that. Um, the supports here go under the neck, and I've zeroed out this dial indicator here. So when I take the strings off, I can adjust the supports until the neck is in the same place, as indicated by the dial. Then I can pull out the frets, level the board. Something funny going on with the zero fret here. You can see how much it's sprung up in the center. Don't know if that's intentional. It's another case of very narrow vintage frets, about 75 thousandths wide by around 25 thousandths tall. I need to get the nut out of the way for fret leveling. These frets feel quite snug in their slots. Took a little bit of extra effort to get them to come free. When leveling the fretboard, I don't put very much pressure on the beam. I don't want to distort the guitar in any way, so this is basically just fingertip pressure to guide it. And you can see what's being removed. Material is coming off the nut end of the body, then there's a big space in the middle, and there's a hump where the neck meets the body. So yes, there is quite a curve to this board. The fingerboard radius is just a little over 16 inches, so that's the sanding block I've chosen. I have to be careful not to sand too much in the center of the board. The, the ends just naturally get less travel, so I have to focus on them and check continually with a straight edge to see what's going on. I work my way up through the sandpaper grits to about 1200. I don't want to go too fine on one of these old vintage boards because it sort of looks out of place if they're glass smooth, you know what I mean? They shouldn't be shiny. I put a radius on some medium wide fret wire and I'll snip it to length. This stuff is around 92 thousandths wide by about 48 thousandths tall. Considerably larger than what was on there. Not quite a jumbo fret, but big enough that you'll feel it. I've gauged the depth of the fret tang that I'm using, and I'm setting up the stop on my fret saw to cut just a hair deeper than that. I don't want a whole lot of extra depth in my fret slots. As it turns out, these slots were just about the perfect depth and width. I did go through each of them though, just to make sure there was nothing obstructive down in the bottom of them. And before I put the frets in, I always make sure to take a small triangular file and just put a little chamfer on the top of the fret slot. This helps center the frets and guides them down into the slot, making installation much easier. 
It's funny how little detail can do that. It also tends to lessen damage to the board if they ever have to come out again, too. We'll put in a little bit of fish glue. Some tappa 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 with a hammer. Squeezity squeeze. Some rub a dub dub. And inspect and perfect. It can be much easier to work on a neck when it's off the body. And this is the most frugal attachment system ever. People complained when Fender went to three bolts. Well, these guys use only two. And you can see and feel the cottony softness of fiberglass inside. The other hole is for neck tilt adjustment through this big brass slug. I'll snip off the protruding fret ends. And I'll file them flush, trying not to actually make contact with the lacquer on the side of the fingerboard and mess that up. This is just sort of getting me very close. This leaves a brutally sharp corner on the side of each fret, which I take off with a safe edge file. Then I refine the portion of the tang that sits flush with the edge using a tiny little needle file. I still don't have the zero fret installed as I need to level all the others, but I want to string the thing up so I can put it back in the neck jig. So I have to make a temporary shim for the nut which has slots that are much too low. It's usually just for positioning rather than height. Checking the relief on the board with strings on, I now have about three thousandths, which I'm quite happy with. So back in the jig it goes. Why don't I fret with it in the jig? Convenience mostly. There's too much stuff in the way. I, I really don't want to pound on it when it's in the jig. And then of course we go back to leveling. It's not very much to take off. So again, I'm very gentle. Starting off, I just do passes in one direction. Now, I do want a little bit of relief in the center of the board, so I'll take a few passes with the short leveler just in that area. I'll also put in a little bit of fall away at the body end as well. Now it's time to recrown the frets. There's not a whole lot to do, but it's important. Polishing, polishing, polishing. Finally, I can put in the zero fret. I've seen people say it doesn't need to be taller than the other frets, but eh, that's not my experience. We just got away with it. Zero fret is about five thousandths taller than the rest, and that gives us just enough clearance over the first fret. Final relief is just around six or seven thousandths. The holes in the body are covered by these little metal plugs, which you can still buy in the hardware section at Home Depot. I use them for covering up uh, holes in pick guards where potentiometers used to live or people don't want them anymore. It's kind of amazing. Behind the bridge, there are some nasty little scratches I'd like to minimize if possible. I'm also going to clean up the tailpiece with a metal polish called Never Dull, which does a pretty good job. On the top surface of the pickup is a gummy residue left over from a decorative mesh grill, which has, alas, gone missing. It's really sticky stuff and took some elbow grease to remove. I eventually got it off. Much better. I use 600, 1200, and 2400 grit sandpaper to get through those scratches. I wanted to remove the pick guard while buffing, but it would not lift up. Something was holding it down very firmly, and I decided best to leave well enough alone. There was just enough room for me to get my skinny wrench under the knob and tighten the loose pot. And I decided I could mask off the electronics there and get in with a foam pad and buffing compound using my electric drill to polish up the surface. I used a medium grit compound, which seemed to match the patina on the rest of the guitar. There's still some traces when you look close, but on the whole it looks way better, and I didn't want to buff through the color layer. One small refinement. Because I used the radius sanding block to reshape the top of the board, the edges are now quite sharp, it's important to go back with some sandpaper and round that over a little and break it so it feels pleasant to hold. I'll also go in and seal the very ends of the frets with some thin super glue. This replaces the little bit of finish that was lost when we pulled them out. 
So the board is looking good. It's time to apply a light coat of tongue oil, which isn't made from tongues, though it smells like it. This makes the color pop, does very little to protect the wood surface, and certainly doesn't feed or nourish the wood, just makes it look pretty, and maybe slows down the transfer of moisture a little bit from board to the air, but that's debatable. Mostly it makes it look pretty. These are almost twice as tall and about 30% wider than the old ones, much more substantial feeling. Let's plug it in and see what it does.